Welcome everyone and thanks for joining us today. I'm Sharon Jaffe Dan, editor in chief of Home and Design Magazine. Our spring issue is hot off the press and we feature an article um, in our annual coverage on landscape design. It's the Excellence in Landscape Awards given by the local chapter of the Landscape Contractors Association. Every year as our editorial team reviews these projects, we dream about pools and hammocks and blooming gardens in the dead of winter. This year was no exception, even though COVID meant that we had to review the projects virtually. Now more than ever, as we're stuck at home, we yearn for warmer days ahead. After all, the outdoors is where we've actually been able to gather and socialize safely during this difficult year. With so many homeowners sheltering in place, they're expanding their outdoor footprints like never before. We hear there's an increased demand for outdoor dining and hangout areas, pools and spas and sports and play zones. There's also increased demand for technology from Wi-Fi to sound systems and kitchens and outdoor lighting as people bring fun and functionality to their outdoor experience. Starting a landscape project is no easy endeavor. So today we're lucky to have two experienced pros on hand who will shed light on the subject. Hans Bleinberger of Mikhail Landscape Design spent summers growing up near Annapolis, which gave him a deep appreciation for nature. He earned a degree in hortic horticulture and landscape design from the University of Maryland and has spent the past 30 years designing and building residential gardens throughout the region. Welcome, Hans. There he is, hello. Hello, Sharon, glad to be with you. Good to see you. Yes. Howard Cohen of Surrounds grew up in Baltimore and dreamt of becoming an architect. Until that is, his mom gave him a plant cutting and he discovered the wonders of horticulture. He graduated with honors in landscape architecture from the University of Georgia then returned to the DC area and co-founded Surrounds. Today, Howard designs a wide array of residential gardens throughout DC, Maryland, and Virginia. Hello, Howard. Hello, Sharon. You? Thank good. you for having me today. Good to see you. So did you guys escape to Cancun or something this week without telling me? <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about your background, Hans. Where are? Where is this project? <laughs> yeah, it's a great project here at Annapolis. Uh, on the Severn River. Uh-huh, beautiful. Yeah, yeah, project that we had designed and built over the last five years, quite a, quite a project. That's awesome. And Howard, how about yours? Uh, mine's a, a beautiful project we did in McLean, Virginia, uh -huh. about five years ago. Uh-huh. It's a, a complete backyard with a pool, big waterfall, and different levels of patios. Really great outdoor space, very interesting space. It looks beautiful. Well, I want to thank you both for being here today. I'm sure with temperatures yesterday in this, I think at 60 degrees, your phones must be ringing nonstop with uh, people ready to spruce up their gardens. Have you been busy lately? Uh, yes, yeah, so it's the uh, level of interest in landscaping is at an all time high, I think. And uh, it's definitely a result of, of uh, COVID, I think. But I think a lot of interest in just improving uh, improving the outdoor spaces that are around, right. around your home. That's great. Well, we have a lot of great projects to share. And uh, this is our, um, this is our, the opener of our, our coverage of the award-winning projects and, and, and our spring issue shares projects from both uh, Mikhail and Surrounds. And we'll be showing highlights of some of the award winners today as we go through our conversation. This is a, a gorgeous project um, in Bethesda by Mikhail Landscape Design. Um, we called it Timeless Retreat, and the company has maintained this garden for more than a decade. It features a porch crowned by wisteria, a koi pond, and a terrace gardens that slope down to a pool. And then this is a shot that, that we didn't include that is this charming courtyard um, covered in mature ivy. So Hans, maybe you can tell us what's, what's most challenging about maintaining a, a mature garden? What does it take to make it look so beautiful? Sure, well, good question. Um, you know, I think the, uh, it all starts if you have 
a great plan and a great design, you have the right plant in the right spot, it helps mm -hmm. uh, with the maintenance component. Uh, one thing about this garden in particular, there was a challenge is, uh, we'll just start with wisteria. Any gardener, anybody that knows wisteria knows that uh, it has a mind of its own. And uh, to get it to bloom as beautifully as uh, you see in these images, uh, it takes a skilled hand to know when to prune it, uh, what, what the difference is between flower buds and leaf buds, but to get that incredible cascade of, uh, of flowers that you're seeing, you know, someone that you might see if you've had a visit to Dumbarton Oaks, you know, which is a classic Georgetown garden famous for its wisteria. So knowing when to prune, knowing how to prune, and then of course, just from the beginning, getting the right plant in the right spot, I think are keys. Right. Howard, anything to add about long-term maintenance and keeping things looking so fresh? I think having an eye for the future when you do design that you realize if you plant the plant that's supposed to grow 10 feet around, then if you give it 10 feet of room, it should mature and become beautiful. And I think one thing that I've learned over my career is uh, is that plants grow incredibly fast around here. And a lot of people are a little impatient about that. So I think understanding that plants do grow and to give them the space and realize maybe you don't need as many plants as you thought mm -hmm. to do a beautiful garden. And as you can see in this example by Mikhail, you see some specimen trees that are placed and they just absolutely frame the views perfectly. And that's, that's, a, that's a really good design like Hans was saying. Right. And that's true. You might not get that full filled in look right away, but right. it's something you, you, you do get soon enough. It's and definitely I, requires a lot of patience to have a garden. Right. Yeah. Uh, in Playscape, uh, we cover this resort like backyard in McLean that Howard designed for a family fun in mind. It features a giant boulder wall that doubles as a waterfall and a diving board while a synthetic turf court hosts soccer games and other sports. There's also an outdoor kitchen and spa. Howard, how did completing this project just before COVID kind of change the game for this, this family who had no idea they'd be home so much? Uh, this family has uh, benefited from this project in more ways than one, even, with, even uh, without COVID, I mean, having the, uh, sports turf field with all the rain and mud we get around here. Mm -hmm. Their backyard, they can use all the time. Um, they even host their local soccer team out there mm -hmm. and they can't go to the, to the public fields or to the schools. Uh, it gives them a place to go and entertain. Uh, they've got the play area for the kids on the lawn and the pool for the adults and the kids and a fire pit, hot tub. It, it's all right there packed into this small uh, McLean backyard. Right. They need never leave. <laughs> they never need to leave. Exactly. So a uh, question for both of you. First, Hans, how do you think COVID has impacted people's priorities, how they view their, their gardens and yards and what they expect to get out of them? Yeah, that, that is the question, uh, question of the last year for sure. Mm -hmm. I, I'd say, uh, it's impacted them uh, in a way, a positive way that probably a year ago, we never thought uh, would be the outcome. Uh, I think what we've seen is folks being forced to stay home, but in that, in that forced environment, they've come to realize what a, what a wonderful uh, venue, their garden, their mm -hmm. pool, uh, their fire pit, all those things uh, really is. I think sometimes in the past years, we've been so busy running around, just doing all the things that we got to do, taking kids to sports games and here and there. Mm -hmm. I think in a really, really interesting way, it's kept us home and really made us appreciate really some of the beautiful things we have. And uh, I think that appreciation has led to people wanting to even go further than they currently gotcha. have in their garden. Gotcha. What about you, Howard? What's your take on, on this past year? You know, it, it's, um, it's, 
it's kind of crazy because I realized that I've been home for the entire year. <laughs> and, and I think a lot of people are that way. And uh, uh, yeah, I think, you, you know, maybe before COVID, maybe you took things for granted that now you really realize how special they are. And I think that's going to really help enhance, I think, the way people feel about their homes and their landscapes. And it, it, this could be a lasting impact. Mm -hmm. uh, and hopefully it is because I think you really only have one home. I mean, well, some people may have more than one home, but most, for the most people, you know, one home, one place, and to be able to entertain there and do all these fun things all the time has a tremendous amount of value. I, I agree. This is uh, just to give you an idea of the scope of work. This is the, the foreshot of that garden. And here's the after with the same view. One thing that we've noticed a lot during COVID is um, an abundance of fire pits. So people really seem to love these areas where they can safely gather outdoors into the colder months and, and um, socially distance, especially if you have a large one. And I love this. So this is in our Playscape project and this is a McHale award-winning um, project that won that, that also features a fire pit. What are some, um, I love how they're, they're integrated into the landscapes. What are some do's and don'ts when you're building a fire pit? Um, what's some good advice you offer people, Hans? Um, yeah, fire pits specifically, uh, I think you don't want it too big, you don't want it too small. Uh, you want, uh, you know, I think a lot of our clients, first decision in the design process is it gonna be a wood burning fire pit or is it or is it not or is it gas you know natural gas or propane so but I think if you've got a wood burning fire pit you, you want to make sure it's sighted from uh, far away from ornamental grasses and things like that but you know I think getting it the right size the right height mm -hmm. uh, with a nice uh, coping like this has uh, try to imagine your kids uh, wanting to roast marshmallows they want to be able to sit and comfortably and safely be able to, you know, get the marshmallow out there, just the right spot, you know, so it gets just the right brown on it, right? We don't want that charred, uh, charred uh, marshmallow. Right. So I think, I think the just keeping it not too big uh, and keeping that coping uh, just the right size so they can sit on it comfortably. And then I think Howard's picture before was really fantastic and how it was brought into a room, its own space. Mm -hmm. you know, it's so important that it just doesn't float out in the middle of the lawn or you know, mulch bed, but uh, the, the curvature of the furniture, the curve of the seat wall, mm -hmm. all, all radiating off of the center point of that fire pit uh, is just, uh, is, is really, really, really well done. Those yeah. are good things to keep in mind. Exactly, it's not an afterthought, but something very well planned out. Right, Howard? <laughs> Absolutely, you know, Hans has, is an experienced landscape designer and, uh, you know, getting the right size is definitely key and uh, having room around that, these things can get pretty hot. So, you know, have some room to be able to move your furniture around, back up um, from the space if need be. And then a place where you can kind of appreciate it too, not, uh, you know, not uh, in some out of the way place, maybe somewhere where, it's out of the way, but it's also in a, in a good spot, you know, just getting the right location. Exactly. We have some more inspiration shots. This is an award-winning project by Mikhail that had sort of a mundane approach to the home. And then this is the after shot. So Hans, maybe you can talk a bit about how, how your company uh, enhanced the curb appeal of this house yeah, so uh, yeah, I think this is a I think this is a really really good example of uh, I would say you know a fairly normal project that we would be called in to address, um, and the first shot just shows how the boxwoods were hiding really a lot of the architecture and the drama of of the space. So sometimes the answer to good design is less is more. So by pulling plants away from it, by subtracting plants, 
we've been able to open up this, you know, really, really lovely portico and then bring that nice bluestone terrace that really makes the depth, the distance from the house coming towards the street, uh, just it, proportionally speaking, I think it really brings it together nicely. Uh, but I think it's from a curb appeal standpoint, crepe myrtles flank uh, left and right, uh, the bluestone terrace, and then again, pulling the plants away so you really are framing the entry, mm -hmm. I think are the key, uh, key elements on this one. Mm -hmm. And these pavers make it interesting too. Yeah, it's a nice, you know, inlaid pavers into turf uh, is a nice way to transition from a bluestone terrace out, out into the lawn. It's, uh, mm -hmm. it's, it, it's, it's, it's nice, it's not that hard to maintain. Mm -hmm. It's a nice technique. Mm -hmm. There's another before and after where uh, Howard's clients had probably a, is this like a 1990s era? <laughs> further than that. Older than that? Yeah. 80s? I'm not sure of the age, but it was definitely a good, good bit of years back. And yeah. It was definitely that kind of. Yeah. So this landscape, um, you reimagined the backyard, which there is a pool over here, but the, you also added a koi pond, an outdoor fire place and a seating area and made this beautiful natural setting. Um, how, how, maybe you can explain a bit on how you, how plants help to kind of delineate the architecture and soften the hardscape. Well, I mean, I think if you just jump back for a sec, the, uh, the hot tub was the only element in that that was saved. Yep. Uh, and it was quite a surgery there to kind of break that all away and expose that hot tub. Uh, but then, you know, then if you go to the after, now your, your hot tub's still in the same spot that they really enjoyed having it, but it's now got a little area to sit around, really just enough for the chairs, didn't need to be more than that. So getting the right amount of hardscape for the use, mm -hmm. and then using all the plantings to really soften and highlight. So in front of the spa, just some very simple sedum ground cover that covers the ground there and doesn't, isn't, doesn't act too busy. Uh, but then you've got this great fireplace with koi pond and there's some big plants that sort of cascade over like the beautyberry shrubs and that beautiful dissectum maple, the red one over there to the left mm -hmm. and some hydrangeas. Really had an opportunity to give the client a lot of interest in their plant material in this yard mm -hmm. um, and make the experience of walking around really fun. And, you know, to the right there, you've got some Amsonia and it kind of guides you down the pathway. Mm -hmm. So it's um, surely the greenery really makes the space so much more enjoyable, but they still have the hot tub. I mean, that's what was there. That was the thing they really loved was having that hot tub. Right. Well, this is, this is great. Each one of these photos, we could spend an hour just talking about the plantings and everything. I agree. I think I forgot to mention, if you're watching and joining us today, if you have questions, type them in the question uh, boxes and we'll have some time for questions after. This also, this project also really stood out to me as, as a fabulous kind of um, grouping of plantings and it's, it's so, so dramatic. Um, and it does feel like it is part of the architecture. And this is a Potomac residence. Um, maybe you can tell me, Hans, uh, what makes a successful combination of plantings and also point out, you mentioned before, when less is more. I, I think this is this feels abundant, but but perfectly uh, balanced. But yeah. but how do people know when they have a couple plants too many? <laughs> <laughs> well, as a as a as a horticulturist, uh, restraint <laughs> is always the hard part of good design, yeah. right, Howard? Oh yeah, very hard. <laughs> you know, when you love plants, you know, and and I, I think in this case. Uh, you know, every client, every site is different. So in this particular project, in, in that one photograph, that frame of that photograph, you really are looking at six different plant species. That's it. Mm -hmm. in, the, in the very, very background, uh, and then in some of the foreground, you see feather reed grass, mm -hmm. Calamgrostis. Mm -hmm. uh, that lavender mm -hmm. uh, purple in the background is Russian sage. Mm -hmm. And then you come to the four, very foreground and it looks like you have a uh, spirea or maybe a knockout rose. Mm -hmm. And then and then you've got a perennial um, that I can't quite identify right there. So, <laughs> so, you know, you really have a very restrained palette. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And I think that the nice, the, in this garden, massing, using limited species, but then massings of those plants makes for a very impactful uh, imagery. Right. Uh, and again, every client's different, every project's different. Uh, I think it's appropriate and it's especially appropriate if maintenance mm -hmm. uh, is, is a concern. Sometimes, I don't think anybody's asking how it can verify this. I think no one's asking for high maintenance gardens nowadays. <laughs> so if we can keep the plant material palette simplified, the maintenance is also simplified. Right. And I think that's, uh, I think that's what we're trying to achieve in this garden. Right, that's beautiful. Howard, what about you? Do you have kind of a rule of thumb on combining plants and how to sort of figure out when you're done or if, if you have enough or if you've gone overboard? <laughs> well, I think one thing is to try to make sure that your garden's going to have something interesting all year round. I think clients just love that, you know, mm -hmm. and sometimes we forget how awesome that is. I mean, there's stuff that blooms, you know, spring all the way through into the fall, even in the winter. You've got, you know, fall color is sometimes so underrated and thought about when people worry, oh, this plant doesn't have a flower. Like, yeah, but in the fall, it's incredible. So plants do a lot more than just flower. Uh, even these grasses, I mean, people don't really think of that as a flower per se, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of color there. And mm -hmm. so just any kind of color besides green that you can get to come out, even with foliage color, uh, like I said, fall color, even the bark of the trees. I mean, some trees have white bark or cinnamon color bark. And all those, all those uh, tricks of the trade, which Hans and I are uh, experts at doing, can create a, a lot of drama and interest through the year. And if we can keep it simple and you try to make these big sweeps of plants, it, it does have a lot of impact visually. Right. What are some, some nice fall plants that have good color? Because I think a lot of our readers know their summer blossoms, but maybe not so much what looks good in fall. Yeah. Uh, I'll say uh, Father Gela is a shrub with incredible fall color. Mm -hmm. um, great Myrtle has a great fall color. Great Myrtle has a great fall color. Mm -hmm. And nobody thinks of that. They, have a, they just think of the flowers in the, in the summer. Right. Yeah, he's right. The yeah, fall beautiful. color on that yeah. is really great. It's outstanding. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any others, Hans? Oh, gosh, yeah. Uh, oak leaf hydrangea comes to mind. Mm -hmm. uh, hornbeam, columnar hornbeams, and I think there may be a few of those in the background. Mm -hmm. uh, it has a great golden uh, golden color. Mm -hmm. Oh, gosh. Uh, Herodia tree. So Yeah, boy, that's a good one. Yeah, you don't hear that too often. Yeah, gorgeous tree. It doesn't really flower but incredible fall color and just structure. Mm -hmm. Like the structure of the trees is a, is a big part of this too, with the shape. Like shape. this tree that was chosen for this project with mm -hmm. the multiple stems there adds a lot of interest in that garden. Right. And uh, I think I saw a little question pop up about natives, which I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about later, but mm -hmm. I wouldn't, uh, as far as fall color, don't overlook just uh, our, our beautiful native dogwood. Mm -hmm. Cornus, Florida, uh, it has spectacular fall color. And then the berries uh, are beautiful as well, so. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a whole nother fall color, uh, or if you will, is the fruit. Right. So, yeah. I love this, this project for the ground cover and, and sort of thinking outside the box. I'm not sure what this particular ground cover is, but I just love the, the color in this, whatever this season is. Yeah, that's, that is the, uh, uh, poster child uh, photo <laughs> for creeping mazes. Okay. Uh, which is a steppable perennial, uh -huh. comes uh -huh. back every year, uh -huh. uh, blooms mostly in, I would call late spring, but blooms sporadically through the season. So, would you consider the, it in this? Here it's used as a ground cover. It is, right, right. And there's also a very lovely ground cover to the left. Mm -hmm. uh, underneath the crepe myrtle, which is a dwarf iris. Mm -hmm. And that is a native, by the way, iris cristata. Mm -hmm. And that, is a, that makes a lovely ground cover too. So. 
I love when when these passageways have kind of unusual materials and it just creates a wonderful wonderful effect. What are your theories about selecting sort of uncovered un, uncovered <laughs> unknown ground covers or less less traveled ones? Do you have favorite ground covers that are not used a lot? Um, Howard, do you want to take that one? Oh. <laughs> I'll throw you the tough one, Howard. So. Oh, that's okay. Um, well, you know, the mazes or mazes, uh, you know, is a, is a great plant. It's not a native plant, unfortunately. So the way they've used it here is great because it'll stay contained in the garden. Um, but there's uh, some natives uh, or more interesting ground covers like maybe um, epimedium, uh, uh, which has a funny name, horny goat weed. And that's a really, that's a really awesome plant because it'll grow in like dry shade, like right around a tree trunk. Um, and has a really beautiful spring flower. Um, and uh, ooh, uh, I can't think of another one. <laughs> that's okay, that's great. You got me out uh, there. So got me there, Sharon. this is a project by uh, Howard's colleague, Chad Talton. And uh, I think it, it is incorporating a lot of, uh, of native grasses. Maybe you can both talk to me about the value and importance of using native species and, and how and when you try to, to utilize them. I, I really do enjoy working with the native grasses quite a bit and perennials. The, you know, if, you, if you have a choice, you could choose miscanthus, which is, uh, has been planted widespread all through our area, or you could choose Panicum, which is a native grass. And when you look at them, they're both kind of do a similar thing, but the native is going to be a better choice because it's going to, you know, it's going to be better for the local environment and it's not going to be anything that might be invasive. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there's so many great choices now. Uh, even a lot of natives have been cultivated into other forms and, and, and varieties. Mm -hmm. uh, so whenever the chances, whenever there's an opportunity, I, I do love to, to incorporate those types of plantings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree, couldn't agree more. You know, so much of our work uh, is Chesapeake Bay centric. Mm -hmm. And some of how our plant palettes are driven by uh, county regulations, Chesapeake Bay critical area regulations. I think it, it folds into our general thesis of just trying to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, whether it's grasses like panicum or uh, other perennials or say just some of the shrubs, winterberry holly, summer sweet, itea, inkberry, all of those things I think have benefits in terms of pollinator uh, uh, benefits. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you have a native plant and it is a pollinator, fitting into the natural environment is only going to support the, the ecosystem uh, in, in a stronger way. So it's a holistic thing. Um, one thing I'll just say here is that we struggle an awful lot with deer damage. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, deer enjoy natives, uh, like good gardeners enjoy natives. Mm -hmm. So we have to sometimes temper the native use uh, because of the deer impact. Mm -hmm. And I've, co I've coined a bit of a phrase, which is called nearly natives. And sometimes when we have deer problems, we have to go to what I call a nearly native solution. Plants that, are, that have the same approach that a native would, they're not invasive. Uh, they, they, they provide habitat uh, as well as uh, usefulness for pollinators, but have the deer resisting uh, attributes. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a, it's a blend. It's mixing the two natives and nearly natives to really get sometimes what you need. Right. Howard, any, any other comments on native and indigenous species? I think Hans couldn't have said it better. I, I might have to cut uh, bar his little nearly native <laughs> idea. Um, yeah, you know, you gotta, yeah, you have to look at your situation um, where you're working, your, the deer population, all these things play into the, these decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not, uh, it's not uh, necessary to have to use every plant native. Mm 
-hmm. even so many natives even are cultivated. And so that they're really not much different at that point than uh, a non-native that was cultivated. Right. So it's, I think understanding the plant and, and what it's gonna do and whether it's gonna jump and get outside of your landscape and into the uh, natural environment. Mm -hmm. So now we're gonna take it back to the beginning and this is just a beautiful plan of Howard's initial project that we saw with the, the playscape to sort of drive our, our last question on, on sort of what are the best practices when if somebody wants a project like this or even something on a smaller scale, when is the best time of year to approach a landscape designer and how does the whole process unfold? And maybe you can each uh, describe your, the way your company works is, you know, on a new project like this. How are you going to go for it, Howard? Right, I'll go. <laughs> Thank you, Sharon. Uh, well, you know, Sharon, there's never a bad time to get started. I mean, I think, uh, uh, I mean, don't call in, in March and expect it in April, you know, that's always tough, right? But uh, I think uh, just being patient with the process, it takes a while. You know, you got to first, you know, measure your the property and get all the topography and do research on the property and know what's going on in terms of what might be required and get a feeling for what you really want and um, how much you're willing to invest into the project. I think it's... Uh, that's a big thing. I mean, these projects are very involved and get, they can get rather expensive. And I think that uh, we're always trying to work with the homeowner um, to develop the perfect garden for them. Uh, and every single thing's discussed, you know, whether we're using native plants or what kind of paving material are we using? And, you know, how's the pool gonna work? Uh, is it gonna have a cover on it? All these things, it's a thousand questions. And Hans and I are, I've been doing this a long time and we can help the homeowners guide them through the process, uh, you know, to design the perfect garden. Sure. Sounds great. Hans, how about, how about uh, Mikhail? Yeah, I, I think uh, starting early and I would only add that in the current environment where we are, the time frames are much more stretched out than uh, typical. Mm -hmm. So I would caution all of your readers and watchers that the time frame uh, is pushed out further right now. But again, there's no bad time to begin the, the conversation. I encourage everybody to take the time and interview the designer, the architect that you're considering. Uh, at the end of the day, you're entering into a long-term relationship and you want to make sure you're hitching your wagon uh, to somebody that you're going to really feel comfortable with and um, that you can relate well with that communicates well. So it's a good time to interview. And uh, again, yeah, I, I think everybody's understands that you can't call in March to get a garden built in April. But uh, again, just start the process, do the interviews and um, and, it, and it is a process. You know, Howard, Howard will tell you that a lot of a lot of our time is spent really trying to find what is it, what are the objectives, you know, really what is it that we're trying to achieve and understanding that from the client. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be overlaid sometimes with what the county or town or the Chesapeake Bay Critical Area Commission will let you do. So that's it can take a year. It can take six months for right. sure. Right. So start early. Be patient, hook your wagon, get your wagon to the right folks. Well, that's good advice. Well, thanks to you both. I think now we're going to turn our screens over to uh, some of our readers' questions. Let's see. Here is a question from Lois West. I live in a townhouse. I usually plant flowers in pots. However, in front of my the front of my house does not get a lot of sun. I was thinking of impatience on the ground there. Any other thoughts for shade plants? Also, I like to attract the butterflies, hummingbirds, and feed the bees in the back. Any suggestions? Well, <laughs> Howard, do you want to go with that? Sharon, would you, would you mind doing me a favor? Would you, yeah. would you? 
summarize that again for me? Sure. So I'm going to ask it in, in a couple of parts. So um, for a front, front of the house that doesn't get a lot of sun, she's considering impatience, but what, what are some other good shade plants? Sure. So um, impatience, of course, is an annual. And uh, I, I would like to think in terms of more perennial mm -hmm. and shrub oriented. I can't see why, uh, and I think there, I know there was a part of that question about native or about insect pollinators and things. Mm -hmm. So some of the native azaleas would be lovely in, in that spot, I think they would be fantastic. Mm -hmm. Some of the shade perennials, Howard had mentioned earlier, talking about epimedium. Mm -hmm. It's a great plant. It's a wonderful plant. Mm -hmm. The sedges um, as well. The carrot species would do really well. It's tough, tough as nails. Which one, Howard? Uh, any of the carrot species, uh -huh. uh, sedges. Mm -hmm. They're very beautiful grasses that grow in shady areas, mm -hmm. depending on how shady. But right, right, right. That is that is the question. How shady? Yeah, shady is a, a hard one. Like some shade is like super deep shade, and then you got like a little bit of sun coming in, and so and then you have different soil conditions as well, right? Which can really impact that decision. So it's not it's not always about the sun. There's a lot of considerations, right? And how about um, species that attract butterflies, hummingbirds, and feed the bees? Well, anything anything that blooms. Uh, will be a bee attractor, will be an insect attractor. Mm -hmm. So uh, the epimedium, the azaleas. Uh, azaleas uh, are, some azaleas are favored by hummingbirds. So you're always looking for that trumpet-shaped bloom, uh, honeysuckles, uh, salvia, which is an, some of the annual salvias are all good hummingbird attractors. Mm -hmm. Another question, the, oh, Howard. The I, best pollinator plant, I don't know if it's uh, shade loving, probably not shade loving, it's like bee balm, Minarda. Mm -hmm. which is a t probably one of the most popular or well thought of plants for that purpose, especially for the monarch butterfly. Yeah. Yeah. Hummingbirds are gonna go, hummingbirds like, typically go to red, red blooming plants. Mm -hmm. So things, uh, Lobelia, cardinal flower is a, is a really good plant if you've got a moist, area for sure. Mm -hmm. when, when trying to incorporate seasonal grasses into a plan, are there varieties that you recommend for our area? Howard? Oh my goodness. Um, yes, there's uh, dozens of types of grasses. I mentioned Carex. Uh, those are incredible. There's so many species of Carex that are really wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, there's the Panicum that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and then there's other varieties where the name gets harder to pronounce. So um, uh, I'm going to butcher the name. So uh, <laughs> Skizakarium, uh, which is um, um, uh, a beautiful um, native grass. Um, um, <laughs> Help me out here, Hans. Okay, well, you could go with Little Blue Stem. Little Blue Stem, thank you. There you <laughs> go. Common name, thank you. Exactly. Yeah, little Blue Stem is a, is a beautiful grass which has more than one variety of it. And we've, we've experimented or planted those and seen really great results from a lot of the varieties that are out, like uh, Standing Ovation is one that's quite nice with a blue, bluish color foliage. Mm -hmm. um, Here's a, a, a good question. Um, how do you suggest bridging the indoors with the outdoors in a work from home environment as the weather gets warmer so you can use the outdoors for working and indoor kitchens for cooking? Hmm. Um, I'm trying to uh, get my head around the answer to that question exactly. So the question is, how do we get the how to bridge the indoor indoors outdoors in a work environment? So I guess working from home. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, if you have a, a really nice patio right out of the back, and you've got some planters around or built-in planters, mm -hmm. where you can have uh, 
some herbs that you can cut and cook with. Mm -hmm. That would be a wonderful way because you've got everything close. Mm -hmm. um, that way you don't have to go so far out into your garden to, to find the cutting plants. Mm -hmm. So I think if you can keep some, you know, really key plants close to the back or close to the door or close to your barbecue area, that would be a, a great way to do that. Mm -hmm. Good, good suggestion. And I, and I think containers mm -hmm. you know, can be overlooked sometimes. Mm -hmm. It really can help bring the garden a little closer to your deck or to your patio. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it just depends a little on your, uh, your home situation, but uh, right. we have an awful, awful lot of really, really wonderful uh, client success stories with beautiful containers of cherry tomatoes and mm -hmm. And of course, it's we're, we're, we're just a few weeks away from planting things like lettuce and radishes and things like that, that you could start to put into a, if you will, a kitchen garden mm -hmm. and right. uh, bring it up on the deck, put it in a, in a great pot. Yeah, it's a great idea. Here's a really good question that I've actually always wondered about. How do you control uh, yard or garden water runoff so it doesn't pollute the pool water? So it doesn't pollute the pool water? Yes. Yeah. Um, I would just say that it, it all starts with good design. And if a pool is built properly and installed properly, that should never happen. Um, however, it sounds like for this uh, viewer, that's happening. So now it's just a matter of trying to uh, divert it at its source. Mm -hmm. So my, my quick answer is work your way back to the source of the water and divert it there, head it off at the pass. Right, good advice. Howard, this is a question from a lap swimmer. Are you able to incorporate or build your pools into the endless pool system? So I've seen endless pools in homes, but never integrated with a regular pool, I don't think. Uh, well, there's, I'm not sure if I understand their question entirely, but if they want to, if they want to be able to swim against the current mm -hmm. uh, and they have an existing pool, there are ways to add jets into the pool that you can swim against. Mm -hmm. And then if they're asking about maybe purchasing one of those endless pools, mm -hmm. they can be custom built into an environment so they look custom rather than just being a big box. Uh, you know, on the that's interesting. That's interesting, though. So, if you want the current, you don't need, actually need an endless pool, but you can just build it into a pool, a regular pool. If you, yeah, I guess you have to be outside. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. there there are some uh, devices that you can build into the pool itself that give you a current, a swimmable current. Mm -hmm. And it depends on the the swimmer. You know, we've we've done a few of these, and one time it was just more for fun. You know, it wasn't really such a importance in terms of the how it functioned. And another time, a client, very serious swimmer, um, we found a device that created a significant current, which I actually uh, experimented and tried. And that thing was uh, in incredibly strong. In fact, if it, you turn it up too high, you, it'll just push you across the pool. Right. So it's yeah. Those are those can be a, a nice add to a pool if you're you know if you're right. into swimming laps and things. Right, and especially now with people not going to the gym so much or their, their regular pools in the summer even. Right, it really does because, you know, not many people have room for 75 foot pool in their backyard. So, right. you know, um, you can definitely uh, create a, a place to be able to swim hard against the current, right in a, in a, all you need is, you know, 10, 12 feet of space. Right. And you can do that. Yeah. Um, do you have some varieties of seasonal grasses that you recommend for our area? Yes, so grasses, uh, blue fescue, uh, any of the panicum, mm -hmm. which is a uh, common name, switchgrass. Mm -hmm. And there's about 10 to, oh gosh, 15 commonly available varieties of switchgrass. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I think there's things that are not technically grasses, like sedges, like uh, Howard was mentioning. Mm -hmm. And rush uh, is, a, is a really interesting grass-like plant. Likes it wet, it's a native. Uh, so I think those are some of the favorites. Mm -hmm. All good textural plants. Mm 
Right. They really bring a, bring a whole new different texture into the garden. Right. Excellent. Uh, how complicated, Howard, is it to redesign or move an existing outdoor fireplace? Well, to move it, I would say that would be impossible to actually move one if it was actually like a full on fireplace. So it would probably have to be you know, rebuilt. Mm -hmm. um, so I, yeah, I would say if there's something about the current fireplace that's it's not in the right spot, it, um, it's not serving the function you know, that you needed, it mm -hmm. probably would be something that would, you would need to you know, maybe start with a new design. Mm -hmm. hard, hard to say from that question exactly, but. Right. So our last question, this is from a viewer who actually lives in the Pacific Northwest. Hans, I'm gonna throw this at you. Okay. Uh, my backyard is quite marshy, especially this year. Is there a hardy ground cover you recommend as an alternative to sod or seed grass? Would creeping moss mentioned earlier be a good choice? Uh, possibly. I think the, uh, I'll, the answer is you need, more, you need more information as to whether it's sun, or shade. Mm -hmm. If it one plant, and Howard mentioned about this earlier, I would uh, have your viewer look at the Carex group of plants. There's many types. Some are very low and could make a wonderful ground cover in a wet area, whether it's sun or shade. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, I think that includes concludes our conversation. I want to thank you both for your time and your expertise and all of your excellent advice. I can't wait to get out in, in the garden and, and also look up a lot of the plants that you mentioned. If people didn't get the names, this um, webinar will go up on our website. We've been putting them all online. So at homeanddesign.com, you can find them all there. And this will be up probably sometime next week. So Hans and Howard, thank you for your time today. And uh, good luck. Uh, getting into the into the high season here. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. As always. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.